try and I'm going to try to get through this content as quickly as possible. There's a lot of content, but um, I want to deal with a doctrine that I think overall is very simple. Should be very easy to understand, but there's quite a bit of scripture on it. And, and as we get into this, maybe I'll I'll see how we want to uh, how I want to proceed. But the subject matter is we're looking at we're at Romans chapter 13 verse number one. The title of my third s sermon is subject unto the higher powers, being subject unto the higher powers. And one of the things that we see in scripture is the authority structure that God lays out just in general. There's different realms of authority that God has ordained in various aspects of life. For example, God has ordained that there should be human government on this earth. Okay, It's not God's will that there is anarchy and no rulers whatsoever. God has established his law. He would that we would implement his laws. That's what God would want. If there was a righteous society today that feared God, that chose the Lord as their God, they would implement the laws of God, where God would be viewed as supreme. He's the high king. He would be the ruler, and then we would set up judges of the law and other governors and people that would that would be at the lower levels of the administration of being able to handle human government but he has given authority to mankind to be able to execute judgment and the reason why he has to give that power is because nobody inherently has the right to just like for example take another person's life God didn't give you that power to just be able to go around and just kill whoever you want, right? Y you don't have that right. But however, God did institute death penalty on certain crimes. So if people are guilty of particular crimes that God has chosen to be capital crimes, punishment needs to be given. Well, in order for a death penalty to be given, somebody is going to have to take that person's life. Amen. Which you're not allowed to do unless God has already given you that power and authority to do that. Right? So things have to be done in order. And that's why when we look at Romans 13, the Bible says there in verse number 1, let every soul be subject unto the higher powers. And this is the higher powers, plural. Because the powers here, for there are there is no power but of God... <coughs> The powers that be are ordained of God. Now, there are people who will usurp power. There are people who will just try to take power on their own. But the real powers are of God. He's the one who grants the power because he's all-powerful, right? You can't get power from, from a lower authority. You have to get it from a higher authority. God is the one who gives the powers. The powers that be are ordained of God. But that statement, the powers that be are ordained of God, it doesn't mean perceived powers are ordained of God. Because, like I said, there's people who will usurp authority and just kind of take power on their own or want to uh, act as if they have more power than they should. And especially with human governments, this is pretty obvious. You see throughout history uh, dictatorships, where they cross the line or the bounds of what God is giving them authority to do, you know, when they carry out mass executions and things like that, they're, they're operating outside of the bounds of their God-given authority. And I would say this, when they just start going after every little thing that you do, they're operating outside of the bounds of the God-given power and authority that he's given because the Bible tells us here what it was instituted for to begin with and what authority they have. Let's keep reading. Verse number two, whosoever therefore resisteth the power, resisteth the ordinance of God, and they that resist shall receive themselves damnation. And, and you know, this is kind of a, I don't want to say it's a deep subject, but it is nuanced, and, and I want to try to cover that nuance as best as possible because on the one hand side, and we're going to look at both sides here, on one hand side, we see here God is very, 
strict in the sense of saying, look, I've ordained these powers. You better obey these powers. You don't resist these powers because if you resist these powers, you're resisting God, which is exactly what he's saying there in verse number two. And when God has set down authority, he expects that authority to be respected and for people to come into compliance with that authority. He says, okay, I have given authority for governments to govern the land. I've given authority for churches to run in the, uh, the house of God the way that he dictates, dictates it ought to be. And he's also given authority within family units. There's a structure within the family of authority that God gives. And all of those powers must be recognized, hey, God is giving this power. Why is that important? Be so that people don't just think that they can do whatever they want because who are you, right? The wife can't go to the husband. Well, I don't care what you say because who are you? Well, God gave your husband authority. Any r random person within, within, you know, underneath the, the authority of a government can't just say, well, I'm going to do whatever I want. I can go steal. I can do that. And who are you? You're just another person. I don't care what you think. I don't care what you do. No, you do have to respect that authority because God put them into place. And the same thing within a church. You can't just walk up and just be like, you know what, I'm just going to get up behind the pulpit right now and just uh, get out of my way. You know, like push the pastor aside and just get, you know, and, and say, I'm going to start talking now, right? You don't have that authority. Amen. It doesn't grant it because God has designed and given us the bounds and the realms in these different areas of authority and is given an authority structure. So he's saying here, look, don't resist that power. Because if you resist the power, then you're, you're going to bring damnation to yourself. God's serious about this. He wants rules. He wants order. He wants everything being done decently and in order. Just as much in the church as he would in the home and within a government. All of those things ought to be ordered and done decently and properly. The way that God outlines. And we're going to look also at the extent of that, because there's a lot of broad language that's used. But look at verse number three, because we already start to see a limitation here in the wording of the, go the, the governmental power. Look at verse number three. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. So we just look at that one sentence there in verse three. Rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. Is that just true about every ruler who's ever existed? That they haven't been a terror to good works? No, of course not. There's been plenty of rulers who have been terrors to good works. But this is stating what God has ordained them to have the power to do. That no ruler operating under the authority of God, using their authority that God gave them, is going to be a terror to good works. Because if they're the minister of God, they're going to allow for the good works to happen, to occur. They're not going to outlaw, you know, preaching the gospel. If they do that, they are no longer within the authority that God has given them. That is not of God. They can choose to do that and try to usurp authority, but they are out of bounds. They are no longer, they don't have that authority. Just as much as I don't have the authority to, to start telling Mrs. Ricardo what to do. Like, hey, Mrs. Ricardo, go over to my house and do the dishes and vacuum the house like I could do with my wife. She's not under my authority as, as a wife. That's your wife, right? <laughs> I have my own wife. She has to listen to me. No, no other woman has to listen to me in the sense of having that. Right? I mean, it's pretty simple. Very simple. Yet there's people out there that are going to tell you different, and, and we'll get into that in a little bit. And, and but Let's just keep going here because I'm, I'm really holding back from getting too far ahead of myself. For rulers are not a terror to good works but to the evil. Wilt thou then not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same, for he is the minister of God to thee for good. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid, for he beareth not the sword in vain. For he is the minister of God, a revenger, to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. 
So we have this, you know, all this language given about being subject to the higher powers and you better obey these, these rulers. But why? Because they're there to bring forth judgment and justice upon evildoers. That's why. They're the minister of God for good. They're the minister to be the revenger, to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. That's their purpose. That's the job, is to be able to keep law and order and to be able to hand out sentences. Because you can't, God didn't want mob rule. He wants things done a certain way. There should be a court. There should be a hearing. There should be testimony. There should be evidence. There should be facts that are all considered. And then an arbiter, a judge, someone that's going to dictate and have the authority and the power to say, no, this is right. This is the judgment. This is what needs to be done. And that power has to come from God because, like I said, otherwise everyone can just go around saying, well, no, I disagree with you, and I think it should be this. You know, there needs to be order, which is why this is being established. However, that doesn't mean that everybody properly follows that order. And because of that, that also means that you don't always have to follow what someone says who is operating outside of their realm of authority. Now, this makes perfect sense. It's been established already, even in human, even in human government. Going back to, if you, if you know anything about World War II and the Nuremberg trials, okay, people that wanted to give a defense of saying, well, I just followed orders. When it came to carrying out extermination of people, that's not a valid defense because you have to be able to say, well, wait a minute, the guy telling you to do that doesn't really have that authority to tell you to start mass extinct, you know, uh, executing people like that. There was no basis for this. There's no foundation. So that's, that's not a defense. You know what? God's not going to take that defense either of saying, well, I mean, someone told me to. It, it's, it's a, you tell this to your kids all the time. It's like, well, if someone told you to jump off a cliff, would you just jump off a cliff? And we want to be careful that we don't get too extreme in our beliefs because there are people out there that will tell you, and, and we'll look at the verbiage in just a second. For example, with a husband and a wife, if the husband says to do something that the wife just needs to just blindly do everything that the husband says. And I'm sorry, but that's simply not true. Now, if you've been coming here for any length of time, you know how much I teach on women subject, you know, being in subjection to their husbands, that, that, that the, the wife is to be in subjection to her husband, as the Bible says, in all things. But when it's saying there in all things, there has to be exception because that is when it's within the bounds of God's authority. For example, if I were to tell my wife to, hey, you see that little boy over there? Go kidnap him, bring him here, and strangle him before me. Now, obviously, that's extreme. But do I just, well, she's my wife, so she just better obey and go and do that. That's stupidity. Yes. That's stupidity. Now, I'm pretty sure even those who disagree with me on this topic would also agree that that is stupidity. But the problem comes in is that they understand the extreme example. But then when it gets less extreme, they fail to see the same reasoning or the logic involved. Okay, and it boils down to if you are doing something contrary to what God has already stated for us, something that would be sinful, you don't have the authority then to, to do that. And no one has the obligation that is under subjection to do something that would be considered sinful against God. Amen. And the reason why is because the Bible says, let every soul be subject unto the higher powers. There are multiple levels of obedience and powers that are in place. 
a child, for example, probably is at one of the lowest levels. They don't have authority over anybody, and just about everybody is <laughs> over them in authority, right? So within the family, they have mom and dad as authorities because they have the law of their mother that they have to follow and obey. It's not just dad they have to obey. They have to obey mom and dad. Yeah. Now, the authority structure has mom below dad, but guess what? Mom's above all the children. And then dad has Christ, and then above Christ is the father. Right. So you have the higher powers, the higher authority, and the person at the bottom is subject to all of them. But if there is any discrepancy, anything in conflict, anything in contradiction, you resort to the higher power as having the final say-so in any matter, right. in every matter. Right. Now, there are many areas where God gives leeway, where he doesn't make statements of this is sinful or not sinful, where you can do either one, and it doesn't matter to God. Right? There are areas, plenty of areas, where we have liberty to make decisions, to make choices, to live our life in ways that, you know, wh whether you wear a green shirt or a blue shirt, <laughs> for example, God doesn't care, right? Now, maybe if they're mixed fabrics, so <laughs> but, but the color, he's not going to care. There's you know, so many different aspects where you can look at it and say, like, well, God's not going to care about that. He didn't say anything about that. So hence, now we have that uh, discernment ability to be able to, to say, okay, well, God didn't prohibit it, so this should be okay. But then a lower authority might say, for example, a husband say to a wife, well, I want you to wear this certain color. Well, you're not asking or telling, commanding to do anything that's in contradiction to anything that the higher authority has said. Well, now you have nowhere, as a wife, you'd have nowhere to appeal to. Because the higher power is going to say, oh, I didn't say anything about that. So you still are under the authority of that level, right? I mean, this, this is pretty simple, and it makes sense. Let's turn, if you would, to um, turn, if you would, to Ephesians chapter five. Ephesians chapter five. I'll read for you from First Corinthians eleven, because this is also where this is where we get that authority structure that I already mentioned. But the biblical evidence for that is in First Corinthians eleven, verse one: "Be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ." So. There we also still have the same thought that be a follower of me, but not just in everything. It's not like just Jim Jones and just drink the Kool-Aid. Hey, here, you poison yourselves. Let's all commit suicide. No, be followers of me, even as I am also am of Christ. So as much as the Apostle Paul is following Christ, you should follow the Apostle Paul. You know, people like to say, oh, I'm not a follower of man. Well, you know what? You should be a follower of man if that man's following Christ. Nothing wrong with that. That's great. But as soon as that man starts to stray from following Christ, stop following that man. Amen. Then you don't need to anymore because they're outside of that realm. That's, that's no longer. Look, Christ is the higher authority, Amen. so we're going with him. Then he says this, Now I praise you, brethren, that you remember me in all things and keep the ordinances as I delivered them to you. He's given ordinances. He's given them laws. laws. He's given them rules. Say, I, you need to follow this. But he still, follow me as I follow Christ. The ordinances I've given you, they, they need to be in line with God's rules, God's laws. And he says in verse 3, but I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ. Every man on this earth has to answer to Christ. That's his boss. And the head of the woman is the man. And the head of Christ is God. That, so I already made that statement. Well, this is where that comes from. 1 Corinthians 11, verse 3. Ephesians chapter 5, though, I want you to look at this. Because I teach on this. I believe this wholeheartedly. But we need to look at the wording very carefully because this is where some people just 
lose their mind. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 22. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. Amen. <coughs> Amen. This is teaching a general statement here. General rule, right? Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. So as much as you would be in obedience unto the Lord, wives ought to be to their own husbands. For the husband is the head of the wife, like I just read from 1 Corinthians 11, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. So there, that, that statement there, in everything, I would say amen to that too. That's what the Bible says. It's true. This is the level of submission and subjection a wife should be in to her husband. It's the, it's the rule, but it doesn't mean there's no exceptions. Because if the husband, as I already mentioned, if, if the husband were to say something like, well, listen, if I were to tell my wife, let's say I want you to you know, come home tonight and I want you to get drunk. And I want you to drink all this booze and I want you to get drunk. Well, drunkenness is a sin. No doubt about that in the scripture. And if I were to say, well, you need to be uh, in subjection to me in everything, I am out of bounds because I am contradicting my head because I have an authority. Even though I have authority over my wife and my children in all things, it still falls under my realm because if I start telling her to do something contrary to what my boss says, I got a problem. But here's what some people will say. Well, yeah, that's your problem, but that's not her. She still just needs to follow you. Uh-uh. No. No. Here's why. Every individual has their own, their own walk with the Lord. No matter who they are. Children, women. Wives, husbands, you know, we all have a, a personal walk in this life. And there are powers, yes, there's rules, there's, there's laws uh, telling us who's supposed to be in subjection to who and everything else, but everybody has the choice at the end of the day of what they're going to do. And you... And you alone are held responsible. Well, not necessarily you alone. Let me say this again. Let me rephrase that. You are responsible for what you do. Now, other people may also be held responsible in addition to you for leading you down the wrong path. So if I were to lead my wife astray, I would be, I'm responsible for her, but she's also responsible for her. Right? You can have more than one person guilty. But the person doing the wrong will always be found guilty. You have to have within your own understanding, your own, you know, the ability to say, okay, yeah, that's sinful, that's wrong. Here's where people freak out about it, though, especially those that, that don't like what I'm saying right now. Well, but that, then you'll have wives that they're just going to be disobedient to their husbands because they're just going to think, well, I mean, I think this is not a sin, and you, or I think this is a sin to do this, and you, you know, but that doesn't happen. First of all, if you're a good husband, that doesn't happen. Anyways, it's, it's the same argument at, that people make and say, well, if you tell people that, you know, they could never lose their salvation, then they're just going to go and party and do all kinds of sin and just do whatever they want because they're going to heaven anyways, right? I mean, how many people have heard that argument before? Of course, right? At people to say that, and they don't even know what they're talking about because they hear about people that say they're Christians and, and live these, these wicked lifestyles, and most of those people aren't even saved anyways. They just hear this stuff, and they don't like what they hear because there's still an element of pride of thinking, well, I'm better than them, so they shouldn't go to heaven, but I should. But making that argument doesn't make it any, you know, well, you know, I've had people tell me, you shouldn't, you know, uh, yeah, I, you may be right about that, but you shouldn't go telling people that. No, but it's the truth. Amen. When should I cover the truth? Hey, look, if this is true, 
then I'm going to teach it, and I'm going to preach it, and I'm going to let the whole world know this is the truth. If it's true that you can't lose your salvation, which it is, I'm going to let everybody know it's eternal, it's forever. Yes, even if you commit the worst sin tomorrow, you're still saved because Christ has saved you. He's given you eternal life. It's not based on how well you keep his commandments. Amen. And anyone with a brain and a sincere heart will understand, okay, just because that's true doesn't mean I'm just going to go off and sin now. I always tell people that want to bring that objection, come to our church and tell me how many of us are just off living in sin now. We all believe what I'm saying. Amen. We all believe that to be true. You show me the person that's just off living this rampant, sinful lifestyle. We don't. We all believe that's true, and nobody's doing that. It's, 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 it's this stupid situation that, you know, doesn't even exist or is so seldom why are you even worried about it it's the same thing if i'm going to say well wife or children hey if your mom and dad or if your husband tells you to do something that's overtly sinful that's in direct contradiction to the word of god you don't have to obey well now, then they're going to be just claiming everything look no they won't no, they won't. If they care enough about the Bible anyways, they're not going to be doing that. Amen. And if they are going to be doing that for everything, me saying that isn't going to be the cause for them just doing that for everything. I'll tell you that right now. Because you've got some big problems at home if your wife is just going to be saying, oh, yeah, well, Pastor Burton said I can just disobey you. No. It makes no sense. So just because the Bible says here, so let the wives be their own husbands and everything. Yes, in everything, but it's, it's everything under your scope of authority. Everything that's in compliance, that is not contradictory to what God has already told us. Now, if, if, it, if it's not in conflict, you obey your head. You obey your boss. If, you, if there's no conflict there, absolutely. Even if you don't agree with it, even if you don't understand it. And I'll give you some examples here. So even if it's a false doctrine, so let, let's take head coverings as an example. Let's say you have a, hu a husband that says, if I, if I tell my wife, Leslie, the Bible says that it's a shame for you to pray with your head uncovered. So you're going to start wearing a bonnet every time we go to church and when you pray. And when we eat at dinner, you're going to put the bonnet on because we're praying to God. Okay. I would be completely wrong. My, I would have a total misunderstanding of scripture. I, you know, I shouldn't be telling her to do that. But if she were to be wearing a bonnet and praying, is she in sin against God? No. I'm wrong. She could be right in saying, but that's not what it means. You know, look, it says it's talking about your hair. You know, but doesn't matter. She's, you know, I'm still in the authority. And I'm not telling her to do something that is causing her to sin. So she ought to obey. So when the Bible says, obey your husbands in everything, that would be an example of that. No conflict. Or if I say, even if I want to be the micromanager, which I'm not, saying, you know what, I don't like you doing laundry on Tuesdays. I want you doing it on Wednesdays. And here's going to be your schedule. And I want you to, you know, she should obey. There's nothing in scripture that says it's sinful to do things that way. Hey, that's the authority that God has given the husbands. This is why it says in everything. Okay, now I don't think that's the best way to lead. <laughs> I don't think being the micromanager and, and, and detailing every single aspect of how you do things at home or whatever is, is appropriate. I think there's way better ways but w when we're looking at the, just the authority, the power aspect of it, God has granted that authority. Same thing with children. Colossians chapter 3, verse 20 says, Children, obey your parents in all things. And it says parents, not just mom or not just dad, both, mom and dad. Obey your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing unto the Lord. Fathers, provoke not your children to anger, lest they be discouraged. 
But then look at verse 22. Servants, obey in all things your masters according to the flesh. Now that also says in all things. So a servant and a master is like an employee and a boss. Don't you think there's some limit to that? <laughs> I mean, if we're just going to use some common sense. See, when God gave us the Bible, he also had the understanding that he already, he knows he gave us brains. <laughs> right? And when I say this, you know, I hesitate because I, I, we want to be careful that we're not just super brainwashed by the world. Where we would get to the point of like mocking things there in the Bible. Oh, oh, oh that's ridiculous. It's not ridiculous, but, but we, do, we do have to use some level of reasoning and understanding when we read the word of God because all the words have meaning. We have to be able to discern what those words mean. And when we're looking at things that say, hey, servants, obey in all things your master according to the flesh, I'm sorry, but if my boss tells me I have to lie to a customer to sell them something, I'm not going to do it. Amen. And I'm not going to be in sin by not doing it, even though the Bible says servants obey in all things your masters according to the flesh. Because that would be sinning against God. That would be breaking one of the Ten Commandments. All of these say very you know, strong language. They know, I mean, obey your parents in all things. Servants, obey in all things. Wives, obey, be in subjection in all things. It has to be understood that you can't contradict the Lord. The Bible says, and I, and I have to go out of order now with, with a lot of my notes, and we're not getting, don't worry about this. I have nine pages of notes, and we're not doing them all. <laughs> I'll tell you that right now. Okay, don't worry. The Bible says in Psalm 66, 18, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. That's an individual. If I'm regarding iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. We all are responsible. Hey, just like we all are going to stand before Christ at the judgment seat of Christ to, to receive of the things that were done in our bodies, whether good or bad, right? Does that say only the men are or only the husbands are or only the father? No, everyone will. Husbands and wives. You can't just defer to, well, my authority said this. The Bible says this in Galatians chapter 5, verse 22, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Those are all good things, right? Well, the Bible says right that against such there is no law. According to God, against all of those things, against the fruit of the Spirit, there is no law against those things. What if a human government says, we're making a law against peace, <laughs> right, or joy, or how about this, faith? Well, the Bible says there's no law against that. God's word, God's authority is going to trump any government that tries to say, no, there is a law against this. I'm not going to have to be bound to follow that law when God said there is no law against that. I don't care what you said. Turn if you go to Acts chapter 5, it, and this is, this is where we really just see this play out. And I mean, if this isn't enough for you to understand that there are exceptions, there are caveats, and that this, this doctrine that I'm teaching, I mean, it, it's in full force in Acts chapter 5. And if this is going to apply to a government, why wouldn't it apply to the home with the wife also? Why wouldn't it also apply with children in the home? Amen. Acts chapter 5, verse number 25. Then came one and told them, saying, Behold, the men whom ye put in prison are standing in the temple and teaching the people. Then went the captain with the officers and brought them without violence, for they feared the people, lest they should have been stoned. And when they had brought them, they set them before the council, and the high priest asked them, saying, Did not we straightly command you that ye should not teach in this name? The authorities, the governing authorities in that realm brought them out and said, Look, we already arrested you for this. What are you thinking? We told you not to preach in this name. Didn't we command you? They're in authority. I guess you should just obey the authorities, right? I guess you, well, 
You're right. I shouldn't have been preaching in his name. And behold, ye have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine and intend to bring this man's blood upon us. We don't like that you're blaming us for the death of Jesus Christ. Verse 29, then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, we ought to obey God rather than men. Amen. Any government, any husband, any father, okay, that's going to tell you to disobey God, the answer is we ought to obey God rather than men. Amen. Every time. That is a truth. Now, does that mean kids should just make stuff up and say, well, I don't want to obey you because I'm going to obey God and God's telling me to do whatever. No, that's ridiculous. Of course. There is right and wrong. And this is why I don't normally go into this much in depth on the exception. Right? Because it's more important to be teaching the rule. <laughs> the rule is, look, kids, obey your parents. Look, wives, be in subjection to your husband. Look, everybody, be in subjection to the powers that be. I mean, th th these are all the rules, and this is what is normally going to be hammered regularly over and over and over and over again. But let's not get extreme and take things too far in our understanding of all of this stuff. Look, we need to have that discipline. We need to have that that groundwork and the framework that says, children, you obey your parents. You, doesn't, you don't have to like what they make you do or tell you to, you know, you obey them. They're looking out for you. They've got your best interests at heart. You know, wives, obey your husbands. It's just God gave them that authority. But there is an exception. There is. You break that, uh, the, the bounds of what God has given you then you're no longer bound. Verse 30, the Bible says, the God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom ye slew and hanged on a tree. So the very thing that they're worried about, is like, they're willing to say that right to him. Him hath God exalted with his right hand to be a prince and a savior, for to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are his witnesses of these things. And so is also the Holy Ghost, whom God hath given to them that obey him. So even further, if someone's telling you to disobey God, you know who God gives the Holy Ghost to? Those that obey him. Amen. This isn't the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. This is the power of the Holy Ghost on you. This is God's power of being able to serve him. God's looking for those that are going to obey him and not be worried about what man's going to do unto you. This includes... Everyone, no matter what authority structure you fall under. God gives to them the Holy Ghost, to them that obey him. But what you need to do and what everyone needs to do in wherever area you are is to try to make everything work. Everything, right? If you are under the authority of a government... As a child, you're under the authority of a government, you're under the authority of a mom, you're under the authority of a dad, you're, you know, like, you're under the authority in the church. You need to be trying to figure out, well, how can I make everyone happy, right? Like, I, how, can I, how can I obey in all areas and be right with God? Because you need to choose to do that. Because I'll break it to you, regardless of what the Bible says, we all still have a choice. Just as much as I, every single day I have a choice to submit to Christ, my wife has a choice to submit to me every day. And we deal with that decision-making every day. And children, they have the same choice. So we're going to choose whether or not we're going to obey every day. It's not just automatic, but we ought to respect those powers. And we ought to do everything as much as possible righteously. So my wife ought to be thinking about if I tell her to do something that's sinful— well, how can I still satisfy my husband and, and, and be able to, to 
comply or be in subjection to what he's wanting, but, but not be sinful, right? And, and a good example is like Daniel. Okay, Daniel was a child. He was taken into captivity, right? He was brought in, and he was commanded that he was going to need to eat of the king's meat and his drink. And it doesn't say it explicitly, but we could assume that it was probably meats that were offered and sacrificed to an idol, and the drink was probably like alcohol, probably wine or something to that effect, because, because he's, he's purposed in his heart that he wasn't going to do this. And the reason why he'd be purposing that is because it would be wrong for him to do it, it'd be sinful for him to do it. But the way that he worked the situation was he just, I mean, he didn't just be like, no, and just was looking for a big fight and just this total rebellion. He was trying to make it work and just kind of be solved and be like, hey, can we, you know, can we just try this out? Will you give me an opportunity here? Can, I, can we kind of bend the rule a little bit and, and give me a chance and to work with it, to, to make it just all work out okay? Because if he were just to be super stubborn in the sense of just coming right out and being like, you aren't going to make me eat anything, it's not going to go very well for him. Right? Now, that may end up being the case, but when you're in a position of, in general, just being under subjection, you want to use the soft answer. You want to you try to make it all work. That's wise. That's smart. And we, we want to do as much as is possible to be at peace with everything, with everyone, right? So if the government's telling us to do things, even if I think the government's acting outside of their authority and telling us to do things that, that they have no business telling we have to do, if it's not making me sin, it's not a big deal, I'll just go along with it anyways because whatever, right? I'm just trying to live at peace with, with all men and, and be able to be blameless and everything else and not give them some reason to be coming after me. It's not that big of a deal. Same thing with any other person under, under authority, you know, just it's not a big deal. Just go with it, you know. You're not contradicting God's word. You're not, you know, being brought into sin. Fine. Just do it. Even the apostle, and, and this, this proves, proves my point here too, that God does hold people responsible even if they are given authority. Like it's showing that they're wrong. So in Acts chapter 9, Actually, no, skip Acts chapter 9. Go to Acts chapter 26. I, I left this in my notes accidentally. Acts chapter 20, it's the same, it, it, Acts chapter 9 is, is basically in Acts chapter 6 is talking about the same thing. So we're going to look at, at Saul of Tarsus before he came to Apostle Paul, right? What was he doing? He was going around, he's persecuting the church. He was given the authority to do this by the governing powers. He had the commission and the authority to go after people who were believers in Jesus Christ and to imprison them and beat them and do all these things, right? He had that authority. Now, what we can't say is, well, the powers that be are ordained of God, so he must have been doing God's work by doing that because he's in that authority and no one should resist and you should just let it all happen because otherwise you'd be rebelling against God's authority. No. Because what he was doing was not of God. God didn't want him doing that. He was usurping his authority. He was going after those who were doing good and doing righteous. And we see this spelled out in Scripture. Like this is literally, we see that what he did was wrong under his own admission and under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost. So let's read a little bit in Acts 26 about what he did. Look at verse number 8. The Bible says, Why should it be thought a thing incredible with you that God should raise the dead? I verily thought with myself that I ought to do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth, which thing all I also did in Jerusalem. And many of the saints did I shut up in prison, having received authority from the chief priests. And when they were put to death, I gave my voice against them. He's consenting to their death. He's saying, yeah, put them to death. And he's testifying against them that they ought to be put to death. These are the saints. These are the people who are, who are preaching Jesus. He's, he's, he's admitting right here, like, yes, I did that. And I had the authority to do so. And I punished them oft in every synagogue and compelled them to blaspheme. 
He's like making these people blaspheme God by, you know, renouncing God or whatever it is that he's making. Them, he's making them blaspheme God and being exceedingly mad against them. I persecuted them even unto strange cities. He's like, man, I chased after them everywhere. Not even just at Jerusalem. I'm like, I'm just following them around and trying to get them. Whereupon, as I went to Damascus, with authority and commission from the chief priest. Look, there's a second mention of him saying, I had the authority to do this. I was commissioned to do this. I was doing my job. And you know what? I was doing it well. At midday, O king, I saw in the way a light from heaven above the brightness of the sun shining round about me and them which journeyed with me. And when we were all fallen to the earth, I heard a voice speaking unto me and saying in the Hebrew tongue, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And I said, who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. I think common sense would dictate that if you're persecuting Jesus Christ, you're in sin and you're in the wrong. And Jesus is literally telling Saul, why are you persecuting me? You are persecuting me. How? By going after the saints. That's what he was doing. So was that, well, that's of God and that power is of God. No, he was wrong. He was out of bounds. That wasn't right. Turn over you to 1 Timothy chapter 1. 1 Timothy chapter 1. Verse number 12. 1 Timothy 1, 12. The Bible says, and I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who hath enabled me for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry, who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious. So he's talking about this is what I was before, this type of sinner. Blasphemy, that's a sin. Persecutor, injurious. But I obtained mercy which means God was holding him responsible. In order to extend mercy, that means you are guilty, right? He was guilty of these things before God. It doesn't matter that he had the authority of the government, according to Romans 13. No, he didn't. He went outside of the bounds of his authority. It's not legitimate. And the, the disciples, like in Acts chapter 5, had every right in God's eyes, to disobey that authority of the high priests and the chief priests and all these other people, disobey that authority because it's against God. That goes across every scope, every realm of authority, the same concept, that same principle. Is it an exception? Yes. But it's one you can't overlook and don't get too extreme in your doctrine. So he said, let's just keep reading here. He says, I did it ignorant and unbelief. So he obtained mercy. And the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. Verse 15. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. He's saying, I'm like the biggest sinner. And the reason why is because of what he already mentioned. I was a blasphemer. I was a persecutor. I mean, I was going after the church. I was, you know, consenting to people dying for the cause of Christ. Like, He's saying, like, it doesn't get much worse than that. But God still showed me grace. And he says in verse 16, how be it for this cause I obtain mercy that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering for a pattern of them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. So he's saying I'm now being used as an example of how long suffering and merciful Lord, the Lord really is. Because if I was doing these horrible sins and being injurious and blasphemy and, and you know, doing all these things against, against God and against his people, that just illustrates how much God still can forgive and still extend mercy and still give his free gift of eternal life. Like that's, that's a great testimony that God has allowed that to even happen to just show us, hey, someone could get really far off into sin, and God can still offer them salvation. But he was given mercy. It, just because you're given mercy doesn't mean you didn't do anything wrong. It actually means the opposite. You did do something wrong. Otherwise, you wouldn't need mercy. Examples. 
just want to cover a couple examples. I already have too many here. Got a little bit of time left. You see examples of people doing things in Scripture. Now, when you see examples and we look at things that people do, first of all, it doesn't autom- you know, depending on how it's written and, wh- and what, it, what the Bible says, it doesn't mean that they were right, first of all, right? Like, if the Bible doesn't tell you who was right in a situation, specifically, you can't always determine that what a person did was right because the Bible records all kinds of things that people do that are sinful. It, it's, the, it's the argument that some people like to use about trying to justify having multiple wives. They say, well, Abraham had multiple wives. David had multiple wives. Yeah, and they were in sin. I mean, literally, especially King David, the Bible literally says that the king should not multiply wives unto himself. So, I mean, that's what it says. But people will still try to say, well, I mean, King David had multiple. Yeah, he was obviously wrong. He also committed adultery, and he also had someone murdered. Like, (laughs) (laughs) he was wrong. Okay, yeah, he did those things, and he was wrong. So when we look at stories, you can't just say, well, and and here's the story, and this is what was used, and this is what I heard. Okay, and I'll turn, if you would, to um, Genesis 18. I'm going to read from 1 Peter chapter 3, and the example that's given is Sarah. Sarah is used in 1 Peter chapter 3 as being a godly wife, as someone who is in subjection to her husband, and she's being praised as being this model wife, right, someone that we could look to. Similarly, like Abraham was was a model father and head of his household and everything else. And amen. They are good examples. But just because they're they're being touted as good examples doesn't mean that they both didn't sin. (laughs) And that their sins weren't recorded in Scripture. So you can't just say, well, since they're the good example, everything they did was right. No. David is a man after God's own heart. But it doesn't mean everything he did was after God's own heart. Right? I mean, let's use some sense. I'll read, you're turning to Genesis 18, I'll read from 1 Peter chapter 3 for you. The Bible says in verse number 1, Likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands. Amen. That if any obey not the word, they also may without the word be won by the conversation of the wives, while they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear, whose adorning let it not be that outward adorning of plaiting the hair and of wearing of gold or putting on of apparel, but let it be the hidden man of the heart in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. It's explaining how wives, like even if your husband is, uh, needs to be won over, look, you do it by just being a really godly wife. That's how you do it. You're going to win your husband. If your husband's not right with God, he's not right in, in, in his leadership, he's not right, whatever, just be a really godly wife. Let him see how a godly wife acts and how they should be, and you can win him over. That's what it's saying there. It's not, it's not complicated, right? And it's also telling us these godly attributes in women. And then it gives us the example of Sarah. Verse 5 says, For after this manner in the old time, the holy women also who trusted in God adorned themselves, being in subjection unto their own husbands. Even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters ye are as long as ye do well and are not afraid with any amazement. Now, specifically here, when Sarah is being referenced as someone who was a good wife, it says that even Sarah was in subjection to her own husband, calling him Lord. Well, the reference is in Genesis 18 of when Sarah called him Lord. We actually see that this one place in Scripture is the literal reference that we have that's going to tell us when did Sarah call Abraham Lord. Genesis 18, look at verse number 9. The Bible says, And they said unto him, Where is Sarah thy wife? And this is when the angels came and Jesus Christ was there right before they went down and destroyed Sodom. Right? Genesis 19 is, is the hellfire brimstone coming down on, on Sodom and Gomorrah. Genesis 18, Abraham meets up with them, right? And they said to him, where is Sarah thy wife? And he said, behold, in the tent. And he said, I will certainly return unto thee according to the time of life. And lo, Sarah thy wife shall have a son. And Sarah heard it in the tent door, which was behind him. Now, Abraham and Sarah were old and well stricken in age, and it ceased to be with Sarah after the manner of women. So, these guys are talking to Abraham. Sarah's kind of hanging out in the back and, and by the door, and, and she hears that she's gonna that they're prophesying that she's gonna have a child, and they're already old. Like she's she's past her uh, birth giving years, right? She's post menopausal. Okay, she she doesn't she, she, her body's not responding that way anymore to have children. 
But she, when she hears this, it says in verse 12, Therefore Sarah laughed within herself, saying, After I am waxed old, shall I have pleasure my Lord being old also. Like, we're both old. So she kind of thinks it's funny, you know, kind of laughs going like, <laughs> How am I going to have a kid? Right? How can I have a child? We're both old. And, you know, thought, it's kind of a funny thought, right? Thinking like, we're, we're both already old. How am I going to have a child and things like that? And then it says, but, but look at what she said. She said, after I am wax old, shall I pleasure my Lord being old also. That's where she's calling Abraham her Lord. And when you look at her other communication, you don't, you don't see that anywhere else in the Bible. But we see that here. And this is her within her own heart. We can see how she's, even in her own heart, she's respecting her husband. She's not saying this out loud to him, but she, that's how she's viewing him. My Lord, right? My boss, my, you know, she loves him, and she is a great example of a wife. She is someone who's submissive. You know, this is, this is good. She's a godly woman. But this is the example where she says that, and then it's, it says in verse number 14, is anything too hard for the Lord? Or excuse me, verse number 13, I, I, I skipped over that. And the Lord said unto Abraham, Wherefore did Sarah laugh, saying, Shall I of a surety bear a child which am old? So now he's asking Abraham, like, why did your wife laugh at that? Is anything too hard for the Lord? At the time appointed, I will return unto thee according to the time of life, and Sarah shall have a son. So what's kind of interesting here is that, like, we're, she's getting rebuked for that. Even in her example of being godly, it's like, well, hey, why are you laughing? Is anything too hard for the Lord? Doesn't matter how old you are. Hey, like God said he's going to do it. It's going to happen. You're going to have a son. Then Sarah denied, saying, I laughed not, for she was afraid. She didn't know what to do. She, she was like, whoa, like, I didn't even say anything, right, because it was in her heart. And she's like, I didn't laugh, right, trying to kind of trying to cover it up a little bit. <laughs> and he said, nay, but thou didst laugh, <laughs> right? Show, I mean, this is the Lord. Right? You, can't, you can't hide anything from God. But um, even in this example, I mean, she's not perfect, right? And we're not condemning her, but she's, she's not perfect. We see this example. But this reference that's being ref referenced in 1 Peter chapter 3 is not Genesis chapter 20. Look at Genesis chapter 20, which is where Abraham, one of the examples, because there's, there's a couple of them, where Abraham is asking her to lie and tell people, you're my sister and don't tell them you're my wife. Right? And this is one of the examples that was brought to me saying, well, she should have lied, and it was, it was right for her to do so, and, and, and if she would have disobeyed, then that would have been sin to her by disobeying because she should just obey her husband like he told her to. Now, I'll be honest with you, this, this is one of those, you know, it could be one of those sticky areas in this regard, that we see on a couple of occasions where people have lied in order to save life, right? For example, the spies that went in to spy out Jericho, they were, you know, the, the woman that hid them sent the, the, the people out another way and, and hid them by lying, saying, oh, yeah, I don't know, I don't know those guys, they, they went that way, right? And she was being praised for doing so, for for keeping them from being killed, right? So you have this, again, another exception where under the threat of, like, losing your life, if you could save someone by, by being dishonest and saying, yeah, that person's not here and you're hiding them, God's going to be okay with that because you're saving life. But, again, we don't say that, oh, how could you dare say that? Now people are just going to start lying. Like, no. This is like such an extreme example, right, that, that it's not what's taught. I mean, we're not supposed to bear false witnesses. This is, this is a commandment of God, but it's, it's the spirit of the law just as much as it's taught by, you know, keeping the Sabbath day. Having this, this extreme view, which was the Pharisaical view of, Hey, if you heal on the Sabbath day, you're working, therefore you're breaking the Sabbath. And, you, you know, when Jesus was healing and they didn't understand, look, that, you know, are you not supposed to work on the Sabbath day? Absolutely. Right. That was the law. But healing wasn't wrong just as much as 
doing a circumcision wasn't wrong, <laughs> right? In a sense, you're still working when you're, when you're performing a circumcision, but it's because you're trying to, to obey all the commands of God. The eighth day occasionally will fall on a Saturday. So you got to do that. And that's what Jesus was explaining. Like, look, look, don't, you know, look at the spirit of the law, what's given. He's like, all of you guys are hypocrites anyways, because if your ox or your ass falls into a ditch on the Sabbath day, you're going to help them out. You're not just going to let them die because you don't want your animal just to, to be killed and destroyed. And he's even, you know, like, and you wouldn't be wrong in doing so by helping them out. So how much more is a person who's, who's you know, need, in need of healing? Of course you could heal them. And this would be a similar example of like, look, this person's going to be put to death. Okay, it's an extreme example. So yeah, if you tell the guys, yeah, they're not here because you're, you're covering from them so that you could save their lives and they're righteous guys and not, you know, it's not like they're some murderers or something. It's like, yeah, that, that example, that specific scenario will be okay. So, and I don't want to dwell too long on this, but if you were to say, well, this is like that. Whatever, right? I'm not going to nitpick over that. I still think it's not right, and I think that we see this also explained in this passage. In Genesis chapter 20, and I'm going to, I'm already gone longer than I wanted to. It's the story of Abraham, Sarah, and then Abimelech, King Abimelech, okay? The first time this happened is with the king of Egypt. And now it's, it's with this Abimelech, and, you know, he takes an interest in her and calls her to him, and she's, you know, at his house, and he's, you know, he comes to find out that she's actually married to Abraham because she said, no, he's his sister, right? And God is plaguing him and, and you know, talks to him in a dream and is like, don't touch that woman because he's someone, you know, God's like sticking up for Abraham which shows how much God has Abraham's back, right? Abraham here is in the wrong in lying because he shouldn't have been fearing what man can do when he's doing the work of the Lord. Like, God's telling you to go do this. So there was no legitimate threat to his life here. He was worried for nothing. And Sarah is going along with what he said, and she's... Continuing this as well, God has to step in and be like, look, th no, this isn't going to happen. And then let's start reading here in um, verse number 10. The Bible says, And Abimelech said unto Abraham, What sawest thou that thou hast done this thing? He's like, Why did you do this? What is it that even gave you the idea that you know, anything was going to happen? Verse 11, and Abraham said, because I thought surely the fear of God is not in this place and they will slay me for my wife's sake. Because his wife was real beautiful, so he's thinking like they're going to take my wife and kill me. That's why he did it. Verse 12, and yet indeed she is my sister. She is the daughter of my father, but not the daughter of my mother, and she became my wife. So if what he's telling them is the truth here, and I have no reason to think that he's lying at this point, he's, he's like giving this half-truth, right? Like, well, technically she's like my half-sister, right? But she's my wife. And it came to pass, verse 13, when God caused me to wander from my father's house, that I said unto her, this is thy kindness which thou shalt show unto me. At every place whither we shall come, say of me, he is my brother. And Abimelech took sheep and oxen and men servants and women servants and gave them unto Abraham and restored him Sarah's wife. So now Abimelech's just blessing him because, I mean, he's already freaked out. God appeared to him in a dream and everything. He's just like, here, <laughs> take this stuff and go, Right? And Abimelech said, Behold, my land is before thee. Dwell where it pleases. Go wherever you want to go. Obviously, God is with you. Like, please, I want to be at peace with you. Go ahead and go wherever you want to go. Verse 16. And look at this. And this is, this is kind of the key here. And unto Sarah he said, Behold, I have given thy brother, and he doesn't say husband, he says thy brother, a thousand pieces of silver. Behold, he is to thee a covering of the eyes unto all that are with thee and with all other." Thus, she was reproved. If you're reproved, it means you've done something wrong. Abimelech said what he said in verse 16, but that colon isn't Abimelech saying, thus you're reproved. That's the narrator of the Bible saying, thus she was reproved. 
if she was right in obeying her husband by lying, then why would she need to be reproved? We all have to stand, one last place, we all have to stand before God. Every one of us. Every husband, every wife, you have, you will be judged according to what you do. Okay? Yeah, there's, I mean, there's the example of Jacob lying to his father, right, and stealing the blessing from Esau. Was he right in doing that? No. How do we see him reaping what he's sown later? Well, because now he keeps on getting lied to. He keeps getting his wages changed. He, you know, he, he gets the wrong woman that he wanted to marry. He gets Leah instead of Rachel. You know, all these different things happen. He was deceitful, so now people are being deceitful to him. It plays itself out. It wasn't right for him to do that, to lie to his own father, even though his mom said, now look, aren't we supposed to obey our mother and our father? Well, mom said, go lie to dad and let your curse be upon me. And he followed and went along with it. And he's going, well, wait a minute. You know, he's not that dumb. He's gonna, he knows that I'm not Harry, you know, and they concoct his plan. But he goes along with it. He should have said no. Why? Because you don't have to steal those blessings. If God's going to bless you, he'll bless you. Amen. He doesn't need your father to bless you. It's not like that's the only way he could have been blessed. No, if you would have done righteously, then God would have blessed you. Then you probably wouldn't have had to deal with all the other hardships that you had to deal with in your life. Amen. You brought that on yourself. Amen. God would have blessed you anyway. He actually would have blessed you probably more by standing up and doing the right thing and saying, no, I'm not going to do that because I'm not going to be deceitful. I'm not going to go and, and be part of this scheme. That's what he should have done. Acts chapter 5, we have one more example here of a husband and wife right, where they, they conspire together, the husband saying, okay, here's what we're going to do, and we see what happens with Ananias and Sapphira, verse number one, Acts chapter five, but a certain man named Ananias with Sapphira's wife sold a possession, they had something that they owned, and kept back part of the price, his wife also being privy to it, and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet, so what they're doing is they, they sell this possession, this property or whatever. They, they sell what they own, and then they decide, you know what? Hey, let's keep some of this for ourselves, right? And then we're going to bring the rest and donate that. Now, there was nothing wrong if they wanted to keep some of the sale for themselves, except they lied and said, this is what we sold it for. So as if... They're giving it all to God. But they didn't. They kept back some of it. Now, they could have just been honest and said, yeah, you know, we decided to keep some of this for ourselves because we got something else we want to do. But here you go. We're going we're gonna to bless the church with this. Could have done that. Amen. Wouldn't have been an issue. Wouldn't have been a problem. But no, instead, they wanted the limelight. They wanted to be seen of men. This is all going to God. Well, we see what happens here. Verse 3, but Peter said, <coughs> Ananias, why hath Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost and to keep back part of the price of the land? Whilst it remained, was it not thine own? And after it was sold, was it not in thine own power? Why hast thou conceived this thing in thine heart? Thou hast not lied unto men, but unto God. And Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and gave up the ghost, and great fear came on all them that heard these things. So he died. This is like God killing him. Okay, Peter didn't kill him. He just confronted him. He's like, why are you doing this? And he just fell down dead. And the young man arose, wound him up, and carried him out and buried him. Verse 7. And it was about the space of three hours after when his wife, not knowing what was done, came in. She doesn't realize that her husband died. She just comes in much later, three hours later. And Peter answered unto her, tell me. Whether ye sold the land for so much. So he, he's just directly asking her, so is this what you sold the land for? The amount that they brought. And she said, yay, for so much. So what'd she do? She lied. Then Peter said unto her, how is it that ye have agreed together to tempt the spirit of the Lord? Behold, the feet of them which have buried thy husband are at the door, 
and shall carry thee out. Guess what? She's also held responsible. It's not just the husband who made the bad decision in the house and said, okay, here's what we're going to do, and you need to tell him this, and you're, you know, well, she kept that. She didn't, she did, she kept the lie, and then what happened? She's held responsible too. You're held responsible for your own actions. Sometimes more people are held responsible. You see Adam and Eve and the serpent, right? God starts, they go down the line going, you know, Adam's like, well, you know, the woman that you gave me, <laughs> she gave this to me and I ate it. And then the woman's going, well, you know, that, that serpent over there that you created that, that says free reign here in the garden, he tricked me and then I did, you know. And, and, but what does God do? Adam's responsible. Eve's responsible. The serpent's responsible. All of them are. All of them were involved. All of them were held responsible. That's the way it works, okay? I don't care who the authority is in your life. If they're telling you to contradict the word of God and to sin, they are wrong. Amen. And you have no obligation to obey. Zero. In fact, it'll be a sin to you if you do obey. I'm wrapping it up. I, I think I've, I've beat this one to death. <laughs> the scriptural evidence is so evident. It's so evident. It's so ap apparent. It's, it's, it's there. A little bit of sense, a lot of scripture. We see the examples. We see the stories. We see this over and over again. Look, we all have to have our relationship with the Lord. Everybody does. It's a personal thing. You choose on a daily basis. Who are you going to obey? What are you going to do? Make God the highest authority. By, by putting man's authority and saying, well, the wife has to do this regardless of what God had said is right and wrong, you are putting man above God and his authority. Cannot do that. I was trying to express the same, the same thought process, and I said, you know, I gave this example of me being at work. I have employees that work for me, and I work for a boss as well. I'm in the middle. If I tell my employees to do something that's bad for the company, they have an obligation not to do what I say because the company is above me. My boss is above me. He has more authority and more power than I do. And if I'm telling them to do something in direct contradiction with what they're saying at the top, I'm wrong. And I don't have that authority. I don't have that power. I could pretend like I have the power, and I could tell them to do these things, but they are responsible for going to the higher authority. I could pretend I have the authority in this church to tell you whatever I want to tell you, you must do this, you must believe that. But it doesn't mean I actually have that authority if it's outside of the scope or telling you to do something that, that is complete contradiction to the word of God. Pretty straightforward, pretty simple. Let's bow our eyes and have a word, a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for, for giving us the, the authority structure. We do need it, Lord, and things work uh, best when, when everyone can fall into line under the, uh, the powers that you've ordained and, and, and when everybody is, is operating within the bounds, when, when people are um, just doing what they're supposed to be doing, Lord, and, and when the authorities are, are ruling properly, when everybody is humble and, and able to just work together, dear Lord, everything works great. You've made a great system and design. I pray that you please help us to overcome our sinful flesh and the spirit of rebellion. And um, that you, but you would, at the end of the day, help us to know when it's appropriate to always just remain faithful unto you. And obviously, if there's areas where we're not sure, uh, especially those that have authority above them, that you'd still just defer to the authority that was given them. Your children should always be deferring to the parents 
wives defer to their husbands. They should be looking to their husbands to guide them and lead them, dear Lord. But in the areas where we see these clear uh, contradictions and problems that, that everybody would individually be able to say, okay, look, I'm going to obey God rather than men. Lord, thank you so much for your word and for instruction. We love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.